look at the cliffhanger from last time. What was the cliffhanger from last time? Anyone remember? Well, we'll, look, we'll, we'll refresh your memory. We'll do like they do on those TV shows, where like the first 10 minutes is to remind you what happened last week, so you can get back into it again. And this goes along with the activity that I posted for you to work on when I was out on Tuesday. can cause confusion, I downloaded the zip file, and if you notice, there's a folder on the desktop called ASP Net Forms, and actually, on the desktop there's a folder called ASP Net Forms. If you open it up, there's another folder called ASP Net Forms. You have to be careful what directory you open when you go back into your application. You have to open up the directory that contains the web config file. So what happens sometimes, if you're not careful, is you can do this. You can go and go up to File, Open, Website, and think, yeah, that's the folder, and open it up. When you do that, you won't see any of your other files here, and if you go to run it, bad things happen. Wow. That's not even the worst. No. That's the worst. Wow. That is the worst yeah. thing ever. So, that's the worst thing ever, exactly. So, what we did wrong is we didn't open the correct folder. We opened the folder that looked like the right folder. So you always got to remember to open the folder that contains the web config. This happens to me a lot of the times when I'm grading, if I'm, if I'm in a hurry or whatever. So when you go and say file, open, website, it's not enough to open that. Look to see if there's another folder underneath that. And make sure you open the folder that contains the web config file. And that will be the right one. Then when you go and run this, you'll notice you see the listing of your files over here, which is a good sign. And when you run it, you'll get the proper results. All right. Here's another thing that's going to save you a little bit of time. We're going to do a few different things with uh, the pages that we wrote down last time. Um, this was the first example that we worked on. Notice uh, this page is called default.aspx. Notice that when I click debug, it brought, it brought that up because I didn't specify a file name. All right? Your home page of your application should be called default.aspx. So if you have other pages, call them other things. All right? But when you're testing, sometimes you want to test right uh, a specific page. Now you can do that by opening up the page in the editor and running it, or you can right mouse on this and say, make set a start page. Then when you run it, you'll get the page that you're working on. So that's a, another little trick. Um, so what I want to do uh, today is talk about uh, the things that I asked you to do in the exercise for Tuesday. Um, I want to play around a little bit styling this page, just to um, sort of reinforce some of the concepts that we had. And I want to talk about the other question we had in the exercise about panels. All right. Um, so let's start out talking um, about this.
this guy. Now the problem with this is that if we just click convert, we get an error. Likewise, if we put Likewise, if we put garbage in there, something that's not a number, same thing happens. And the reason is, is again, the problem is with this statement right here. Answer equals convert to double the value of the text box. Now you need to do that because a text box can contain what? It can contain text. All right? Therefore, you need to somehow tell uh, the server that, yeah, I know this is a text box, but trust me, there's a number in it. Therefore, treat it like a number. Convert it to a double and do this math equation. And that'll work fine and good if you actually do supply a number in here. So if I go in and, whoops, put a number in here, it does give me the right answer. So zero, uh, 32 degrees Fahrenheit is zero degrees centigrade, gives me the right answer. But we don't want a program that can blow up if someone types in bad input. So therefore, the, pro the, 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 the solution is to do validation. Now. How many of you had the intro to C-sharp? How did you do validation in that class? So you'll think twice before you raise your hand now, right? Because I'm going to ask a follow-up question. Yes, how did you do validation? We provided the user with a text box that said, like, hey, don't write that in here. That's not where that goes. Okay, but all right. That, that's how you displayed the message. But how did you run the validation to see if it was valid or not? Like a try catch or something like that. You could do a try catch. All right, that would be one way to do it. Try parse. Try parse. That would be another way to do it. Could have a series of if statements, maybe. I, I, I don't know. It's been ages since I taught that class, so I don't know like the, the way that they're teaching it. But could do a bunch of different ways. Well, here's the thing. In uh, the .NET framework for web pages, you have validator controls all right, that you can use. So you don't really have to write this code you can count on the validator controls working. And I'm going to talk about validation uh, in a second here. But essentially, validation controls are controls that you can put on your page, you can associate them with one of the other controls on the page, and you can define validation rules. All right? So I'm going to talk about the, the probably the simplest one, the required field validator. Then I want to talk a little bit about validation in general. All right? And we'll talk a little bit about why validation is a little bit unique in a web environment, all right, compared to a desktop program, pro programming environment. All right, here are the validation controls that you have. Usually I go into visual mode for this. They're all listed under validation controls. We have a pointer where I'm not going to worry about that. That just changes the pointer. Um, I'm going to do these in a different order. Well, I'll do them in, in alphabetical order. A compare validator. A compare validator will allow you to compare two different controls on your page. When might you use that? When would you, when would you, want, to when would you want to validate based on comparing two different controls? Yes. Great example. If, if you entered a range of something, so you, you want to see the transactions on your checking account. If you do that, you want to make sure that the first date is not after the last date, right? Otherwise, that's valid, uh, invalid, rather. So you would want to put, you know, July 1st through July 5th, 
or July 1st through July 1st even would be okay. But you wouldn't want to say uh, July 1st through uh, June 30th, all right, because that is invalid. It is. All right. So therefore, you'd use a compare validator that. So compare validator compares against two, uh, compares two controls. There's another classic example of when you use a compare validator. You've all done this, I would bet. Yes. When you're doing passwords. When you're doing passwords, exactly. When you have to enter the password, then it'll say enter the password again. So to make sure that you don't typo on the password. There's a compare, well, that functionality has happened. And in, in ASP.NET, you can use a compare validator to say, hey, password box one has to equal password box two. All right. So that's a compare validator. A custom, well, a custom validator, it's kind of goofy to do them alphabetically. I should have taken another approach. But custom validator is where there is no, where there is a goofy validation scheme that doesn't fit any of the above categories. It allows you to write some code to do the validation. And what's more, to hook it up with the ASP.NET validation scheme. It just allows you to, to do all your validation through the ASP.NET validation model, even if you have some really weird validation scheme that doesn't fit any of the above. And I really almost can't even think of a, a validation that wouldn't fit that. The only thing I could, could think of is if you validated... Um, I, I don't know. If you pick Canada, you have to pick a province. If you pick United States, you have to pick a state. But there's other ways to handle that as well. Uh, so I don't know. I can't really think of a good example when you use a custom validator. A range validator is when the, num when, when the value that you entered has to be within a certain range. All right? So for example, if you're entering a date of birth, all right, um, What would be a range for the date of birth of a person? What would be a valid range for the date of birth for a person? Assuming the person is alive. Yes. Yes. No date after the current date. Well, no date after the current date, definitely. All right, that would be one part of it. And what would be the validation for the starting date? Pardon me? 100 years 100 ago. Years ago? 100 years ago? Maybe, maybe 120 years ago to be safe. I don't know how old the oldest person is. It's like over 100 Yeah, so, so you'd, pick a, you'd pick something. You know that they wouldn't be born, for example, in the 1700s. So maybe you would put in, uh, let's, say we, let's say we'll be very, very careful and say 130 uh, years ago. So what would that be? That would be 1887. So you might put in the date has to be between 1887 and... Uh, September 7th, 2017, all right? Um, if you're entering in temperatures, your range might be, um, uh, you know, whatever valid temperatures on Earth would be. Like, this is a Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. If we talked about this being a temperature conversion for temperatures here on Earth, all right, it wouldn't get any colder than negative something all right, we could look it up in the Guinness Book of Records, and it doesn't get any hotter than, I don't know, 120, let's say. But we could find that range and put it in and make sure that it was in that range. A regular expression validator. This is where the data that you're entering fits a certain pattern. Can anyone think of something that could be validated with a regular expression validator? Password, password? Yeah. I, 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 I wasn't sure about that, but you're right. You know, places have certain rules for passwords, right? Um, you know, it has to be at least eight characters long, has to contain a number, for example. Might be a password rule. Um, I hate those rules. There are sites that I go on, and I know it's for my own protection and all that, um, <laughs> but there are sites that I go on that I can never remember my password because the rules are restrictive. And every single time I use them, I reset my password. My trash bill, all right? 
every single time I pay my trash bill, I think it's once every three months, I have to reset my password because I only do it every three months, all right? Uh, their rules are so convoluted, and I don't really get it because if someone wants to log in and pay my trash bill for me, I guess I'm okay with that, all right? <laughs> And I don't really mind, I don't really consider that personal information, I don't know. I'm, I'm sure there's reasons for having that extensive security, but I do, I have to set it every time. So those, those rules will be an example, the bottom line is those rules will be an example of a regular expression. You can define a, a, what's called a regular expression, and they're really confusing to read, but they are standard to say it has to be at least eight, eight characters, has to contain a number. What will be another example of something, a regular expression? An email address, right? Yeah. What is the rule for an email address? There is a certain number of characters. There's at least one character, I would think. Um, there's an at sign. There's at least another character. There's a period. Then there's probably at least two other characters. So at least one character, at, at least one character, period, and then at least two characters, I would think. All right, so that would be an example of, now, that's a different sort of validation to say this is a real email address, right? This is simply looking to see if it fits the form of a valid email address, all right? Does it look like it could be a valid email address? That's different than saying it really is a valid email address that belongs to someone that you can send an email to, all right? So that would be a good one. Other examples. Social security number, right? It is what? Three, two, four? I think. Something like that. Right? Uh, but it has, a, it has a certain format. All right? Um, phone number. Phone number can be tricky, right? Because depending on the context of your application, you might require them to enter uh, an area code or not. All right? So the validation could be a little bit different. Also, depending on the context of it, if it's international, you might have them enter a, 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 a nation code, all right, which would make it a little bit different as well. Um, those are all. Th those are some of the basic, you know, ones that that, that are easy to think of. A, a little more uh, involved would be maybe your company has a rule for what its part numbers look like, all right. Maybe your company's part numbers are two letters followed by four numbers. You know, that's just the rule for your part numbers. You know, that's how they get assigned. So then, yeah, then you could write a validation to do that. So regular expression is when the data being entered in fits a pattern. The most simple one is a required field validation. It means there has to be something there. All right, has to be something there. And for text boxes, this is really straightforward. For drop-downs, this becomes a little more tricky, and we'll talk about that uh, a bit later on. Finally, a validation summary. Um, this depends on how you want to display error messages. Um, there's a lot of different ways that you can display error messages. You can display the error uh, right next to where the error occurs, which is like sort of my favorite way to do it, right? You might as well show the error where it occurs, all right? You could also have a summary on the bottom of the page showing all of the errors that you got. And that's also a good way. Or you could do a little of both. Maybe you put an asterisk next to the fields that have a, uh, a problem, and then you have a detailed description of what the problem is in a little area underneath. But the validation summary allows you to group all your, all your error messages together and display them in one place. Um, Okay, can you only have, all right, let, let, how, how, can I, how can I phrase this? Can you have more than one validation control on a field? Probably. Yeah. Probably. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the answer is yeah. What would be a case when you might want to have a, uh, a, a more than one validation on a field? Yes. Like password? You have to put in a password. Okay. It has to be a certain yeah. 
yeah, you, you you know it's required. You, you have to it has to match a certain format, and it has to match the other, you know, the path and re-enter password. So that would be an example of where you'd have that. Um, another example is um, if you uh, uh, if you have something that's required. I'm sorry. Let me rephrase that. If you have something that's not required, no. I'm confused. Required only checks to see if something is entered there. So if you have something, if it's required, and uh, if it's required and it has to fit a format, you'd have two validators. You have a required field validator, and you'd have a um, maybe a regular expression validator or a compare validator or whatever. All right. You might say, gee. Why doesn't, if you have a regular expression validator, why does it not also check to see if there's something entered in there, right? Because a regular expression validator will allow you to put nothing in a field. And that almost seems like a contradiction. Like, it has to fit this format, but it will allow nothing. If you think that through, that's actually a good thing. Because you may have for a field, for example, like a phone number that isn't required, but the user can put it in if they want to. Well, it's not required, so you can't complain to the user if they don't enter it in. But if they do enter something in, it needs to be a valid phone number. So the fact that these other controls, these other validation controls, don't assume that there has to be something in that field is actually a good thing. So in a case like this, I'm going to put two validators on here. I'm going to put a required validator first. All right, and then I'm going to put a compare validator. Now, a compare validator, we said before, compares two different controls. Well, hmm, what's up with that? You know, there's only one control here. You could also use a compare validator to check the type of data it is. So you can compare one text box to another, or you can compare one text box to see if it's an, a number or a date or whatever. So I'm going to go and I'm going to grab my required field validator. I'm going to put it right here. Required field validator has an error message that you give. This will be the text that will display if there's a problem. So I can say must enter value. There's a few other properties here. I want to focus on the one, control to validate. That is what field do we want to be required? Well, there's only one, the text box. So that's pretty simple. But we still have to select it. If you don't select the text box, it doesn't know what to validate, and it will give you an error. So now when I go and run this, Yes. Do you specifically have to put it between the button and the text box? Or you can put it anywhere. No, you can put it anywhere you want. Okay. All right. Now, if I put nothing in here, I did not get an error. Wow. No error. Which is good. I get this goofy error. Of course. All right. Um, this I would consider a bug in the upgrade of ASP.NET, right? Because, of course, it isn't my fault. I have to blame it on someone. <laughs> yeah. What they did is they switched the default mechanism for doing validations. And in doing that, if you want the old style, if you want the validators to work the way that they always have since the first, first version of ASP.NET, you have to put something in your, in your uh, ASP.NET control file. So let me go and find what that is. I'm going to go and copy the code from something we did last semester. And you'll just need to copy this code into your ASP.NET control file. So let me pick up 
243 for spring of 2017. Let me just go and find any old example. Probably an example from later on in the course. offending line, or not the offending line, this is the line that we want to copy. So if you go and do uh, an assignment and um, you get this error, just go and copy this line from my control file, or config file, into yours. <coughs> App settings, validation settings, colon, unobtrusive validation mode. You'd think if it was unobtrusive you wouldn't have to do anything to configure it, but I guess they have a different definition of unobtrusive than me. Alright, let's go and run this. Now if I don't enter anything in, boom, I get the error message must enter value. Alright. If I enter garbage in, I still get the error. Because the validation control literally only checks to see something is in there. Alright? So, let's fix this. Let's fix this problem. And then we'll, we'll look at the next piece of the puzzle. So I'm going to put a, a, control valid, a compare validator in. I'm going to say must enter number as my error message. Control to validate, I'm going to put in text box 1. That's all right. Oh, no, I'm looking at the required validator. Compare validator. Control to validate will be text box 1. If I was comparing it to another control on the page, like if I had a starting age and an ending age, I would put the second control in there. All right? But I'm not. I'm comparing the data with the type. So, that is... Last year. Oh, operator. So you could set it to be equal if you're comparing passwords. You could set up that they're not equal, that they're one is greater than the other or less than the other. I'm doing a data type check. And then I have to put in, for that data type check to work, I have to say that we're dealing with a number here. Or we're dealing with a double here. Now if I go and run this, If I put nothing in there, I get the required field validator. If I put garbage in here, I get compare validator. Now, one thing you might, might, might notice is that error message takes up space whether it's being displayed or not. Right? Notice that the compare validator is displayed over here. If I put nothing in it, it says must enter number. If I put that in it, it displays that error message. That usually isn't good to do it that way. Um, we can do that by changing the options or changing the, um, the um, display property of the validator controls. So instead of saying display, which means that it only takes up the space if it's being displayed. 
All right. So I'll do that with both validation controls. I'll make the display dynamic. That way it doesn't take up the extra space if it's not being displayed. Uh, also, the one thing I noticed is the error message for the compare validator simply says compare validator. I'm going to make a message that says value must be numeric. So boom, I get that error message. Boom, I get that error message. Yes? Is there a way to get it to pop up as like a window telling you this message? Is there a way to get it to, to, to pop up as a window? Wow, you didn't realize how innocent a question that is and how I'm going to answer it in about three hours of ramblings. <laughs> wow. The answer to the question, is there a way to, is almost always yes. All right. The bigger question is, is do you want to? And generally the answer is no. That sort of validation is very obtrusive to the user. It pops up, they have to close it. Let's say, for example, that they missed six fields in their validation. A window pops up that says, you missed these six fields, blah, 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 blah. Or even worse, it displays them one at a time. Oh, that's horrible, right? Um, and then it displays the form back again. Gee, what were the six fields I forgot? It's much better to display right on the screen the validation message. So I would avoid doing that. All right, that wasn't so bad. No, it wasn't. All right. uh, but yeah, I, I would avoid doing that. I would display that on screen. The Thank better you. question, which we're going to address in a minute here, is that error message doesn't really stand out. All right, It is in the same font as everything else. So we'll talk about how to address that in a minute. But first, I want to talk about validation in a more general context. All right? And to do that, I'm going to draw my famous diagram. OK. A client connecting to a web server. server has server-side scripts, which remember are little programs that can run and can do stuff. And the server processes these scripts, takes in the request, which includes the URL, the form data, and a bunch of other stuff. It uses all that in processing the form, and then it sends a message back to the client, which is an HTML page, which consists of HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. The one thing that we didn't talk about in, I don't think I talked about in the introduction of this course, maybe I did, but I don't think I talked about it a lot, was what JavaScript does. Uh, yes. What does JavaScript do on a web page? It allows stuff to. Uh, it allows it allows the user to interact. All right. One thing JavaScript is big for is interactivity. Right. For example, if you have my, um, uh, drop down menus, pull down menus. Is if the user puts their mouse on an item, the menu appears. They scroll, they, they go off that item and put it on another item, a different menu appears. If you think about it, that JavaScript code is sent by the server to the client, and that code runs right on the client, all right, which offers a bunch of advantages. Number one, that code runs on the client, which means that you don't have to take a trip through the internet to the server and back to have that functionality occur. That code executes right on this client. Remember, in most cases, that client's a computer also, 
right? So therefore, it has processing power. It can run programs. Browsers can run JavaScript. So therefore, if you put your mouse over something, there will be JavaScript code to, to show this menu, hide this menu. So the user gets a more immediate result, all right? Because they don't have to wait for going through the internet. And again, with a bad internet connection or a server that's busy or any number of factors, that could actually take some time and sort of spoil the interactivity uh, uh, experience for the user. All right? So there's some code this set, this JavaScript, that can do some processing on the client without having go to, to go to the server. All right. We also have code on the server that does things like making the web page, uses a database, and so on. Where do you think validation belongs? On the client side or on the server side? Okay, we have a vote for client. Do we have a... Any other votes? I say both. Okay. All right. We have an answer for both. What kind of validation? Hmm. Good question. Why does that matter? Round of validation. All right. So, 
When you can do the validation on the client side, it's better to do it for everyone. It, it takes some load off of the server and it gives an immediate response for the client. Now, what sort of validation cannot be performed on the client? We mentioned one, passwords. What about with a credit card? We said entering a credit card number. What might be some sort of validation re relating to a credit card number that can't be performed on the client, would have to be performed on three the server? Three-digit number that they always ask you to, uh, three-digit number on the back. Oh, the three-digit number? Yeah. So they have, you, you put in the credit card number, you put in the three-digit number. Well, I could, the, the client can make sure I put in some three-digit number, but to look up to see, did I enter the right three-digit number for my credit card, that's going to require integrating with a database, all right, or some other credit service or whatever. But it's going to require more extensive resources than exists on the client. You wouldn't want the client to be interacting with the credit service, even if it could, right, because of security issues. Therefore, checking that three-digit number to make sure it's the right number for that credit card would be an example. Other examples of validation that you would have to perform on the server are similar to that. All right, I entered in a 15-digit number, but is it a real credit card number? Right. I mean, or did I just type in 11111111111 and, and see if that works? All right. No, it has to be a real credit card number. How do you know it's a real credit card number? Well, it's looked up in some database somewhere to say, yeah, that's a real credit card number. Is a credit card number stolen? Is the credit card been reported stolen? Has the credit card uh, over its limit? These are all things that require more extensive processing than the client can offer. So even if you write perfect client-side validation, you'll also do sort of a next-level validation um, on the server for things that the client can't um, can't doesn't have the resources to do. So that's one reason why the answer is both, all right? Because you're going to do sort of two levels of validation. You're going to do the simple validation like, is all the data entered correctly? And then you're going to do, um, is the data valid up against some sort of validating database? There's a second reason, though, this real, real, real simple of why, you re why validation is done both on the client and the server. Any ideas on the second reason why you do validation on both? It's tougher to uh, crack. It would be tougher to crack, absolutely. And closely associated with that is the fact that users can turn off JavaScript on the client. So you can you could go in your browser settings somewhere, I don't know where, all right? But somewhere, depending on the browser you use, it click a box and say, hey, don't run any JavaScript. All right? In which case, if all your validation is done on the client side, then, well, it might let an order go through without a credit card number. All right? So therefore, you have, this is one case where you have redundant code. All right? Usually, redundant code, you know, if, if I see redundant code, you know, I throw my arms up and, and steam comes out of my ears and, and, you know, I get really annoyed. But this is one case where redundant code is okay. All right? So, because it's not really redundant. It's sort of like a, a uh, it's sort of like a fail safe. It's making sure that that validation occurs. Now, what does this have to do with these ASP.NET controls? Has this to do with the ASP.NET controls? These controls work both whether, you're, whether JavaScript is enabled or not. So if JavaScript is enabled, your validation will occur on the client side. All right? So this code generates, remember we talked about, you know, ASP.NET controls generate HTML, JavaScript, CSS. The validation controls both generate JavaScript instructions to work on the client side, and they generate server-side code to do the validation as well. So I don't have to worry about repeating, duplicating the code. All right? 
Therefore, for all these reasons, it's to your advantage to use the, the validation controls as opposed to writing your own sort of validation. All right. So getting back to this. I mentioned a few times that the, the focus of this class is not on design. But we should pay a little attention to it, and we should know how to make things work if we want them to. All right? So, what I don't like about this error message is it's kind of hard. It, can, it could easily get lost with the rest of the data on the form, especially if you could imagine a bigger form that had a bunch of fields and so on. The error messages don't stand out. So what are the things that we could do to make this error message stand out more? Change the color. All right. Bold now, pardon me? Bold print. Bold, exactly. Put it in a different area. Put it in a different area, maybe. All right. These are all things that we could do that would fall under the category of design. All right. Would changing the color be enough? Did someone have another suggestion or something? I thought I heard someone say something. <laughs> okay, so for my second three-hour rant today, <laughs> for all the reasons I described, alert boxes aren't a good idea. All right. Um, People use like symbols and asterisks. Yeah, you could you could you could do that and all that. Um, what I would say though is this: consider accessibility with the web. All right. So. When would color not be, when would color not work for a person to display an error message? Colorblind. They're colorblind. Colorblind, of course. Right. So therefore, does that mean you don't use color to dis display an error message? No. No. What does that mean? Yes. Should you use some kind of like audio sound? Or? You, could use, you could use audio. That sounds a little bit like overkill. Because again, they're just colorblind. They can see stuff. They just can't distinguish colors. Well, you do something different besides the color. You do it in addition. So we had some good suggestions before. We could put the errors in italics. We could put the errors a uh, bold. We could put the errors a bigger font. We could put the errors in a different font, and all that. My point is, is that in addition to using color. Um, if you're using color to designate some sort of meaning, use something else as well. All right, that's a fundamental uh, accessibility guideline. The idea of multiple presentations. We're going to display information to the user in a couple different forms. Therefore, if they're not capable of distinguishing one of the forms, they can distinguish the other. So, color is one way we can designate an error message. By making the font bold, that would be another way. So let's go and do that. One of the things that's tricky for people sometimes is figuring out how to link the code that you create in ASP.NET with all the old stuff that we learned in, HTML, uh, in, in CISS 216. All right. So that's why I spend a little bit of time doing this sort of stuff. So let's go and do that. And let's see what we have available. First thing I can do, I already have a style sheet, right? I can apply that style sheet to the second page, which I probably should have done anyhow. temperature convert and I have this style sheet. Now, let's look at all the properties because what you want to find, the, the question, when you're asking the question, how do I incorporate CSS into this ASP.NET control, you have to see where the hooks are, right? It's important to know the HTML that gets generated and it's important to know what the properties are on the ASP.NET control. So if I look at this ASP.NET control, and I look at the properties for this validation, 
I notice one of the properties on this control validator is the CSS class. Ooh, that looks promising. It does. I can assign a CSS class to this, and it will get whatever the look that is. I could do it some other ways, too. I could go in and I could set a back color, a border color, all those things. But you know what? The CSS will help me to keep my applications consistent. If I go and use some of the other ASP.NET properties, then I might have one page that displays my error messages one way, a different page that displays them a different way. And you sort of defeat the purpose of CSS. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into my CSS file and I'm going to create a class for error. So dot error. Dot error. And I'm going to make the color red. And I'm going to make the font weight bold. All right. So I've done two things, right? I've done two things to um, to um, make this message stand out. So if you're colorblind, you'll see the text in bold. All right, so that should help make it stand out. If you're not colorblind, you see a red and bold, so it extra stands out. So what I'm going to do then is I'm going to go in my page, and I'm going to put for each of these two things a CSS class of error. So now when I run it, I don't put something in. I get it, the error message displayed. All right. Now again, I could have gone into these attributes on the ASP.NET control and changed the foreground color and all that. But then I would have to do it exactly the same on every error control. All right. And what's the chance of doing that? And you're going to end up inconsistent. All right. Now if I decide I want my application change to maybe make the error messages um, a darker shade of red, all my error messages then get that change. And all my error messages, not just on this page, but every page where I've done that, is done. So we're keeping it consistent. This is one of those like finer points of ASP.NET in my mind. It's not forgetting all the good principles we learned in web development and all the good reasons for using CSS. I think they developed ASP.NET this way to handle people that knew desktop programming but didn't really get this whole web thing and we're waiting to see if it's going to catch on before they bother to learn it. All right. So there are properties for most ASP.NET controls that allow you to, to, to change the appearance of that. However, you are better off using, where you can, the CSS properties for all the reasons that I cited. Questions about any of this? All right. Let's go and let's add a drop-down to this. Let's make our code a little more flexible so it doesn't handle just um, Fahrenheit to centigrade, but it can do Fahrenheit to centigrade or centigrade to Fahrenheit. Okay, so I'm going to do a drop down. So I'm going to change some of these labels. Enter temperature. All right. So now there has to be a way for me to designate whether I want centigrade to Fahrenheit or Fahrenheit to centigrade. So I'm going to go under standard and I'm going to put 
drop down list. We're going to drag that over. I'm actually going to move that down here after the two validators, before the button. One thing I ask you to do is to make sure that you go and sort of dot the I's and cross the T's. For example, my button, the text on the button is button. I'm going to change it to say convert. I just noticed that now. All right, so I have my drop-down list. <laughs> right now, there's nothing in the drop-down list. And it says unbound. All right. What unbound means is it's not connected to a data source. What is a data source? A data source typically will be a database query. So, for example, let's say we had a drop down that showed all the different divisions at Lorain County Community College. You know, engineering, business, IT, uh, health services, uh, arts and humanities, and so on. There's probably a database table that has that, all right? And rather than hard coding that information in the dropdown, it would be better if we got that list from the database and then use that list to populate the dropdown. That way, if they added a, a division or got rid of a division, our dropdown would automatically be adjusted. Eventually, we're going to do that, but not today. Today, we're going to hard code the values in. So, I'm going to go here. And I'm going to say edit items. And I'm going to create two items. The first item, the text is going to say Fahrenheit to centigrade. And the, net, and the value is going to be FC. The second one is going to be centigrade to Fahrenheit. And the value is going to be CF. What's the difference between the text and the value? The text is what the user sees. The value is what the script is going to see. All right? So, if I put CF for the type of conversion, the user might be able to figure out that that means centigrade to Fahrenheit, but, but maybe not. All right. So I'm going to put that there. All right. So now I have my nice drop down. I can put something in. I can select the kind of conversion except it doesn't really work. The drop down's there, but I'm missing something. What am I missing? Still converting. Yeah. Yeah, it's still converting. Yeah, the code is still doing the centigrade, oh, I'm sorry, the Fahrenheit to centigrade conversion. So I have to put code in there. I have to put code in there to do either of the two conversions. So, could do this a couple different ways. I'm going to do this if I have to refer to that drop down list, which was called drop down list one. I have to pick the value that was selected. That is in a property called selected value, cleverly enough. If the selected value equals FC, Fahrenheit to centigrade, then I calculate the answer this way. Since there's only two options on the drop down, I can just say else and calculate it this way. Plus 
plus 32 text box times 9 fifths. Plus 32. 32. And then I put that answer in the label regardless. So let's run it and test it. Okay, right. Let's see what this does. Alright, Fahrenheit to centigrade. So if I put 212 Fahrenheit, it should be what in centigrade? 100. Okay. And that worked. Good. If I put <sighs> 0 centigrade, what would that be in Fahrenheit? Should be 32. And it does work. So, pretty sure this works. We would want to test it thoroughly just to make sure that it just didn't coincidentally work for those couple of values. But I'm pretty confident that this works. All right. Let's review what we have here. This is code that runs on the server. So right now the calculations are simple. We probably could do this in JavaScript. But we're demonstrating ASP.NET server stuff, so this could be a more complicated uh, calculation. On the button click event, we look and see if uh, they've picked Fahrenheit to centigrade. If we, if we did, then we do the calculation this way. Otherwise, we do the calculation that way. And how do we determine that? We look at the drop-down list and we look at the selected value. Remember when I was entering in the stuff for the drop-down list, there was a display text and the value. I'm interested in the value. The value, of course. All right. I'm going to put in another little catch in here. That This is one of them that you're going to have to sort of trust me on. All right. The only reason for this code is if the validations, if, if JavaScript was disabled and, and the simple validation controls that we had ran on the server side. Because if the validations run on the client side, then we'll never make it to this point unless the data is valid. Because if it runs on the client side, then it will give me an error and it won't proceed. Whereas if JavaScript is disabled, the validations will fire off on the server side. And if it's not valid on the server side, we want to stop all processing. So we have to put this catch in. And it's only there in case.
case server side validation, in the case client side validation is turned off on the client. It's a good habit to get into though, to put it and wrap all of your processing code around the is valid. Indeed. All right. The last question I answered in the exercise uh, for Tuesday was what does the panel control possibly have to do with lab two? All right. Let's look at lab two. Lab 2 says, take what you did last time. So Lab 1 had three sections, one for ASP.NET, one for database design, one for SQL. I want to alter Lab 1 in the following way. Add a dropdown that contains the three topics along with a dummy option that says, please select topic. All right. Initially, the page should display no topics, only the dropdown and the submit button. When the button is clicked, if the please select topic is uh, selected, display an error message using uh, saying the page should only display the content related to the selected topic. So I want to drop down. It says ASP.NET, database design, and SQL. You pick SQL, it displays only that section of the page. All right. There's parts of this that we haven't really talked about how to do in class. And that's sort of part of the expectations. Um, next time, I'll take any questions you have about, and I can address any questions that you have individually in LAM about how to do this. But you understand the basic mechanics of it, all right? You should be able to create a dropdown that has these things in it. How to validate that dropdown? We haven't completely talked about that yet. We've talked about validation controls, but not how they work with dropdowns. So maybe you let that piece go for a while. The one thing I asked about is how to handle, what does a panel have to do with it? Any thoughts on what a panel would have to do with this? Yeah, Well, what I would do is I would put each of my three sections in its own panel. All right, panels in ASP.NET control. You can put whatever you want to about, you can put any number of tags uh, in your section about ASP.NET, in your section about SQL, in your section about database design. What you're going to want to do is dynamically show and hide the different panels. It's, it's not that bad, believe me. No need to scream. All right? You'll dynamically do that. How do you do that? Well, properties. There are properties that you can set for a panel. One of the properties is the display property. And you can make it visible, or actually the visibility property. You can make it visible or invisible. So based on what they pick, you can make it visible or invisible. All right? It's much easier to show and hide one panel than to show and hide five or six different HTML tags. So this just sort of groups things together so you can treat them as a unit and show them and hide them together. We can talk about more of the, about this either in lab or um, next time during lecture. Any questions? All right, we will see you in lab. I'll go unlock lab, then I will be back.